Well, um, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming along this evening to this uh, Yorkshire Sound Women Network workshop. Um, and we're really pleased um, to have to be able to welcome uh, Freddie Vinehill Cliff from Nugent Audio this evening. Evening. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving up your time, Freddie. Um, one thing I will mention before we get started is that we are recording uh, tonight's seminar uh, with the view of making it available afterwards for people who want to catch up with the content of the session online. So if you feel more comfortable, you you might like to have your video off, bearing in mind that it's you know, going to be made available afterwards. Um, so up to you whether you have your, your camera on or, or off. Um, and also, I think un unless we're having a discussion, it, it'd probably be good to keep your uh, microphone off and unless Freddie you know, is, is asking us to, uh, to contribute to something. Um, so um, obviously Freddie is from Nugent Audio. And if you don't know Nugent Audio, they're actually, they're a Yorkshire based uh, plugin development uh, developer. They're based in Leeds, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, and as you know, this evening's session is gonna be talking about everything to do with uh, loudness uh, and I think it's, it's not going to be specific to a particular door or anything like that you're going to perhaps give us a really general overview is that right Freddie? Yeah I'm, tr I'm trying to make it as sort of applicable to as many different situations as possible rather than rather than zoning in on on a specific door or a specific um, right. set of plugins. And I, I, yeah great and and for those not familiar with with the work of Nugent, will you be talking a bit about product, the various products at the end? Yes. So, so much? Yeah. yeah. So I'm making it sort of general to start with, and then towards the very end, I will do a quick kind of a demonstration of some Nugent Audio loudness products. But I'm yeah, d d uh, trying to make it as general as possible prior to that because you know I d don't don't just want it to be a sales pitch. Great. And I'll just mention that if you've got any. Any questions as we go along? I'm sure it's fine just to fire, fire them out as we go. Um, it's pretty relaxed and informal, but or if you don't feel confident speaking up, just write it in the chat and we can pick it up there. Okay, I'll pass over to you, Freddie, then, if that's okay. Great. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely okay. fine by me. Yeah, if anyone has sort of any, uh, there'll be a few points where I'll kind of stop for questions anyway, um, but if you do have uh, something that comes to mind when I'm not, kind of opening up the floor then just put it in the chat and that's absolutely fine i'm just gonna share my screen so you should all be able to see this um not particularly pretty looking powerpoint presentation now but um yeah it should have uh, hopefully some useful bits of information so um as heidi kind of said this is going to be a bit of a crash course in loudness i'm not trying to make it new gen specific i'm trying to make it applicable to whatever loudness software or hardware or whatever tools you might um, be interested in using if you would like to learn specifically about some new gen loudness products like i said i will be doing a little bit of a product demonstration at the end but you can also go to the new gen audio youtube channel and um, we've got plenty of content on there about some of our loudness tools so that includes uh, master check viz lm lm correct and isl but like i said i will do a, a brief kind of rundown of those at the the very end as well but i just prior to that wanted to make it kind of as uh, as as broad as possible um so before i start uh just to kind of get an idea of where we're all at does anyone have any prior experience of kind of working within loudness standards or the, does anyone already use any loudness measurement or loudness normalization in your existing workflow? Either, either you can unmute and pipe up or, or, or say in the chat either way. Hi, it's Lorna. Um, so I, I've just been um, trying to make uh, music in, a, in Ableton just for like about 18 months and I've been using, um, I think it's Lean Loudness Meter. Um, but I have to say, I'm just mystified, and that's why I'm on here. <laughs> sure, that's yeah, um, that's a totally reasonable place to be. I can see Rosie's mentioned in the chat that that she's using Ulean as well. Um, Ulean isn't one that I've used specifically, but as I understand it, uh, in the politest possible way, I think it is 
very similar to uh, our BizLM loudness meter. Um, I think it's sort of a it perhaps it might be inspired by the uh, the new gen loudness meter uh, is maybe, maybe the most diplomatic way I can put it. So probably some of what I what I show you at the end of this LM um, might be applicable applicable to that. I think it, I think it is free as well, isn't it? Is is you lean? I'll I'll t I'll take that as a yes. Yes, there we go. Um, cool. Okay, so. Um, a little bit about me before we kind of get uh, properly into it. So my name's Freddie Vinehill Cliff. I am the product specialist at Nugent Audio. What that means is that my job generally is to know how all the products work and to be able to communicate that to people. So what I spend a lot of time doing, although not so much lately because of the pandemic, but usually what I spend a lot of time doing is going to audio conventions and presenting our software and um, we'll have like a booth with a with a little computer and audio setup uh, and i'll be showing whoever's at the convention what we've been working on recently i also do a lot of studio visits so i'll go to um either music production studios or audio post-production facilities where they're either places where they're already using our software to see how they're making use of it um and to see whether there's any way we could adapt the software to kind of better suit the way things are being used um or places that aren't necessarily using our stuff, I might go to kind of show them how they could potentially integrate it uh, into into what they're doing. Been with the company for five years. Prior to that, I did a BA in Creative Music Technology at the University of Hull uh, and an MA in Critical and Applied Musicology at the University of Leeds. I'm also a touring musician and uh, an occasional live sound engineer. At the moment, I'm doing um, a few bits of live sound at Wharf Chambers, which is a venue in Leeds that you might have been to. Um, if not, you should, because it's really nice. Um, also, I've just seen in the chat, sorry, Holly, um, you mentioned getting to grips with loudness metering for podcasting. Yep, I think some of what I'm talking about today should be relevant for you as well. Um, I should mention as well i've just uh i've skipped past this but it's probably important um we are offering for anyone who was in attendance at this workshop um we're offering 50 percent off any new gen audio plugins if you are interested in um in any of those after after the fact so if you go to newgenaudio.com forward slash gifts um then you can put in a discount code which is ysWn as in Yorkshire Sound Women Network 50. So it's YSWN50 um, if you are interested in that. Um, but let's get on to talking about loudness. So um, I'm going to go right from the very beginning. If you already have some knowledge of loudness, then I'm, I'm sorry if some of this is things you already know. But um, what is loudness? So loudness is more accurately referred to as perceived loudness. It's measured in LUFS, L-U-F-S, which is also sometimes referred to as L-K-F-S, and it's always measured over a period of time. So you can't have like a, a, a sort of instantaneous loudness measurement. It is always over some period of time. Um, it uses the same relative scale as decibels. So what that means is that if you have a project that's a certain loudness measurement, if you turn up the master fader by 1 dB or down by 1 dB, as long as you don't change anything else um, about the audio, then the loudness measurement will either go up by one loudness unit or down by one loudness unit. It'll be the same as whatever dB change you make. That does get a bit more complicated when you've got other bits of processing like any kind of limiting or anything like that. So that's why it, it can be a bit confusing, but in in very, very basic terms, it does scale up and down uh, at the same rate that, that the dB meter on your master fader would, would scale up and down. Um, the loudness of an entire program or song is called the integrated loudness, but there's also short-term loudness, momentary loudness, LRA, which is also known as loudness range, and true peak. So we'll talk mostly about integrated loudness today, but I will talk a little bit about true peak as well. Short term and momentary are very similar to integrated loudness, but they 
refer to a specific length of time. So integrated loudness is just whatever the full um, the full project is. So if it's a three minute long song, then the integrated loudness is measured over three minutes. If it is an hour long program, then the integrated loudness is measured over an hour. Where short term loudness is specifically, I think it's three seconds. Uh, momentary loudness, I believe is 300 milliseconds. Um, Loudness range is the difference between the loudest and the quietest section in a project. And true peak is a way of measuring the, um, the, the peak volume, but it's a specific um, type of peak volume that's used in a lot of loudness specifications. Um, the ITU BS1770 recommendation is the international standard for measuring loudness. You can go and look that up. It's a PDF document you can read online. There's a lot of jargon in there. Um, it's worth taking a look at, but I would say that um, a lot of it isn't stuff that you'll need to know in kind of your day to day as, as an audio engineer, but it is, is worth going and kind of uh, taking a look at trying to get your head around it. Just seeing we've got another message in the chat. Oh, there we go. Sorry, it's just, me, sorry. just no. That's all right. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't wasn't missing anything. Um, okay, so loudness gets used a lot in audio for TV. Um, so anyone who's mixing or producing audio for a TV program, there are in a lot of cases either legal requirements or certainly network specific requirements for how loud. Uh, a TV program needs to be. In the UK, um, interestingly, um, there aren't actually legal requirements for how loud a program can be. Um, it's just all kind of done on consensus. So all the major TV um, networks have agreed to aim for a particular loudness target, but there isn't actually a legal requirement. Um, but the, the kind of most common one is that uh, in September 2010, the CARM Act was passed in the US and that banned TV commercials from being broadcast louder than the accompanying program. That was adopted in December 2011 and, and, uh, and that's when it actually started to be enforced. So there was just over a year between them passing it and them actually starting to enforce it. So during that time was when everyone had to go out and buy loudness meters in order to make sure that they were um, sticking with whatever whatever the requirements were. And of course, even though the actual legal requirements only apply to um, adverts, what it means is that the programs in between those adverts are all kind of aiming for the same loudness target as well. So even, even though legally it only applies to the adverts, it, it ends up being applied to everything just just to get that kind of consistency. So in the USA, they use the ATSC A85 loudness standard. That's another document that you can go and look up online. Although again, it's full of a lot of jargon, a lot of which you won't necessarily need to know, but that specifies an integrated loudness measurement of minus 24 LUFs. There are other loudness standards used worldwide. Most of Europe uses the EBU R128. Um, and that specifies an integrated loudness of minus 23 LUFs. So I believe that is the target that's used by consensus in the UK as well. It's just that it's not an actual legal requirement here. Um, and both of those, the ATSC 85 and the EBU R28 are based on that ITU recommendation. Um, so they, they use um, that ITU BS 1770, but they've just come to slightly different kind of conclusions from that. Um, the difference between uh, a program measuring at minus 24 and a program measuring at minus 23 is fairly negligible anyway. And what you can do is if you've mixed a program that's going to be broadcast in the US uh, and it needs to be then subsequently broadcast in the UK, you can just turn up that master fader by 1 dB and it will be at minus 23 or, or kind of vice versa, as long as it's still within the kind of true peak limits and things like that. Um, again, that is where it gets a little bit more complicated, but I will move on to talking about True Peak in a little while. Um, in more recent years, Netflix has introduced its own bespoke loudness specification for their Netflix originals. The target loudness value for that is minus 27 LUFs. Um, but on top of that, um, their best practices document asks for a dialogue gated measurement rather than integrated measurement. So what that means is that the loudness that's being measured 
isn't all the sound that you're hearing. It uses a, a, an algorithm to only listen to the dialogue. So it essentially ignores any sound that isn't dialogue. Uh, and and the loudness is based on that. So um, you can use a lot of, well, some loudness meters will have um, a dialogue gated setting, um, which allows you to, to achieve that kind of measurement. So that's specifically mixing for Netflix, but a lot of audio engineers have found that it is actually possible to mix simultaneously to a dialogue gated value of minus 27 and an overall value of minus 23 or minus 24. So that means, again, if someone's mixing something for Netflix, but they're also mixing it to be used in other platforms, it's it's straightforward enough to do. Um, and again, that's that's something that although you may not be mixing something for Netflix. It's something that, that is worth keeping in mind because there are a lot of good reasons why it makes sense to mix audio to a dialogue gated standard and, and why it makes sense to have that consistency in the dialogue. Does anyone have any thoughts about why? Uh, and this isn't a trick question, by the way. I'm, you know, happy to happy to give the answer. But does anyone have any ideas about why Netflix might have chosen to use a dialogue gated measurement and and focus solely on the loudness of the dialogue? Because essentially, their standard, within reason, doesn't care how loud anything else is. It's just about that dialogue gated measurement. Any ideas why why that might be? Hi, Holly. Hi. Um... Can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think, um, and I don't know about anybody else, but I've struggled in the past with TV and movies to hear the dialogue, but also in between action scenes and dialogue scenes, I'd have to turn down the volume and then put it back up again. And <laughs> it's been quite frustrating. So it's exciting to hear that an algorithm is being used to hopefully counteract that. Is that the case? Do you know what? In some ways, the the dialogue gated algorithm that Netflix uses almost has the opposite effect. In that their their Netflix originals, the only the well, it's not the only thing that matters, but the main kind of anchoring point is that the dialogue has to be a certain volume. But the sound effects and the music, excuse me, sorry, the sound effects and the music can be as loud or as quiet as the production company decide for it to be. So I kind of, um, I, I, I agree with what you're getting at there. And I think someone who's tasteful when they're mixing a program would hopefully kind of adhere to what you're saying. But actually it is possible for the Netflix standard to have that op the opposite effect to what you're talking about, which is uh, not not great in some ways, but, but the reason or at least as I understand it, the reason that they go for that dialogue-gated um, measurement is for people who might be watching in less than ideal listening situations. So if you're watching a program with headphones on a train, small speakers at home, you might have the dog barking so you can't hear what's going on, you might have next door's washing machine. As long as the dialogue is a consistent level, then people can still follow what's going on in the program. So that the, the idea is that it means you don't have to keep turning it up and down because at least the dialogue is consistent all the way through. But like you've kind of alluded to, Holly, that doesn't necessarily mean that the, the music's not going to be painfully loud or the sound effects aren't going to be painfully loud. But it does at least mean that the dialogue is just going to be, regardless of, you know, even if you... Uh, stop watching one program and you switch to another program also on Netflix, you know, another Netflix original, the dialogue is still going to be at the same level. So you aren't going to have to mess around with anything in order to follow that and to hear what's going on. But uh, it, it certainly doesn't solve every every problem uh, as, as, yeah, as you kind of, kind of alluded to there. Um, like I said, even if you aren't mixing for Netflix, you could still use dialogue gated loudness measurement to your advantage. Uh, and even if you aren't using a plugin which has that dialogue gated loudness measurement, like the new Gen Audio Viz LM loudness meter, it is still possible to achieve those kind of dialogue gated measurements. So you could have a loudness meter on the master bus, and that will be measuring your integrated overall loudness. And you could have another one, you could set up an aux send in a project and uh, have 
just the dialogue going to that and, and take a separate measurement with that in order to kind of have your dialogue at a sensible level. And, you know, Netflix is the biggest streaming service in the world. If they're normalizing the dialogue at minus 27, anything that you're mixing yourself that has dialogue in, it probably makes sense to aim for a similar level because people are already kind of used to playing stuff out um, at that at that loudness level. Um, and that's just one way of kind of bending loudness to your, to your will. Um, so that's sort of an overview of loudness for TV production. Um, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about loudness for music production. The theory behind it, in terms of there being integrated loudness, loudness range, short-term momentary loudness and so on, all that is the same, but the way that it's applied is actually quite a lot different. Um, so most music streaming services also enforce a target for integrated loudness. So currently Spotify, Tidal and YouTube music all use minus 14 LUFs. So that's quite a lot louder than, um, than the, the TV loudness targets. Apple Music uses minus 16 LUFs. Again, that's, that's a fair bit louder. The difference is that Netflix and their competitors expect engineers to submit audio which already meets their loudness standards. Whereas music streaming services apply the loudness normalization after the fact. So that means that to some extent, you can, uh, you can submit any audio to Spotify, regardless of how loud it is, and they will turn it up or down after the fact. So that's why when you listen on Spotify, everything, at least in theory, should sound the same loudness level because it does all get normalized after it's been submitted. The kind of interesting uh, exceptions to that are SoundCloud doesn't have any loudness normalization. So that means that you still get some things on SoundCloud that are painfully, painfully loud. And I, I suspect in some ways that might be why certain producers quite like to use SoundCloud because it does just mean that they can make things obnoxiously loud. Um, and also YouTube, although they have that minus 14 LUFS target, it's a little bit um, mysterious how YouTube achieves that target. Spotify, Tidal and Apple Music all normalize the audio before it goes up on the platform. Whereas on YouTube, when you upload something to YouTube, people can watch it straight away or listen to it straight away. And it's sometimes weeks or months or years after that, that the YouTube algorithm actually normalizes the loudness. So you'll sometimes find things that have been on there for quite some time that aren't yet normalized. Apparently, there there is a gradual process that they are going through and normalizing everything. But I think because there's so much content on YouTube and because it is accessible as soon as it's uploaded, they've basically got a backlog is how I understand it. Although they're kind of secretive about, about where where they're at with that. But the point is, you can upload audio of any loudness to these platforms and either they'll um, normalize the, the audio for you after the fact, or in the case of something like SoundCloud, it just won't be normalized. And that has its own kind of pros and cons. But I think, and a lot of people think, that it is still wise to bear in mind those loudness targets when you're mixing or mastering music um does anyone have any ideas why it might still be wise again not a trick question just curious about any 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 thoughts anyone might have why 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 it would be wise to keep those loudness targets in mind when when you're mixing and mastering um well the the main reason i would say is headroom um so talking when i talk about headroom what that means is the kind of um the difference between the sort of loudest point in your audio and the loudest that digital audio possibly can be. Um, so when you're mixing or mastering audio, when you're working digitally, there is a, a limit to the highest peak. So I'm talking about peak volume there. I'm not talking about loudness. Um, but the, the difference between the highest peak in your audio and the actual highest possible peak is is the headroom. Um, you want to make the most of the available headroom. There's no point having a big, big gap where there's just nothing 
nothing happening. Um, so if your track that you're sending to Spotify uh, measures at minus nine LUFs, then you're going to lose significant headroom when that's playing out on any kind of streaming service. So when it's played on Spotify or YouTube Music or Tidal, you're going to be losing 5 dB, 5 decibels of headroom. So if it was previously peaking at 1 dB, then it's now going to be peaking at, sorry, not 1, minus 1. It's now going to be peaking at minus 6. It won't sound any louder than any other songs on the platform, but it will be significantly less dynamic because it won't be using as much of the available headroom. Um, and if you master significantly below the target values, then you'll have the same problem in reverse. So say, for example, if you... Let me think the best way to illustrate this. If you submit something that's, say, minus 18 LUFs to Spotify, that's going to have to be turned up by 4 dB, which means that they're potentially going to have to have to apply additional limiting so you're actually going to lose headroom in that situation so say your your audio is minus 20 luffs um, and it's peaking at minus 1 db that's going to be turned up by six in order to um to play out at the the loudness loudness level for spotify that's then going to be peaking at plus 5 dB. So they're going to have to limit that really heavily and you're just going to lose a lot of information that you've that you've sent in that master. So for that reason, it makes a lot of sense to at least bear those loudness targets in mind. There's a lot of kind of compromises um, that you can make with that, at least partly because not all the streaming services use the same loudness level. So you can't possibly... Um, upload something which is going to fit Spotify and Apple Music perfectly, for example. But bearing these things in mind and thinking about what kind of compromises you're happy to make um, is is kind of the way to do it. So, you know, you might choose to master a couple of dB higher than what the loudness target is for those streaming services, or you might try and do it halfway between the target for Spotify and Apple Music. There's all kinds of different different approaches that you could that you could have to that. Another thing to keep in mind when you're working with loudness for music production is this idea of micro dynamics and macro dynamics. So I talked before about integrated loudness being measured over the entire length of the song. So if it's a three minute song, then the loudness is an average measurement taken over that whole three minutes. That means that individual sections of the of the song could be louder or quieter than that. As long as the overall track meets that target, then you're still absolutely fine. So when we talk about microdynamics, microdynamics are dynamic changes on a transient level. So if you zoom in, you can literally see your audio waveform getting bigger and smaller, um, and that's microdynamics. So that's literally just the, the kind of the swell, the, the sort of peak and trough of individual sounds. Macrodynamics are larger scale changes over an entire track. So for example, you might have one section of a song which is significantly louder than the rest. That might be the last chorus in the song. Maybe you've just decided to make that significantly louder. Maybe there's um, a tension building section that you've deliberately tried to make quieter. So taking advantage of that, you can still have some sections in a song which really kind of stand out, really pop out of the speakers, as long as there are loud and quiet sections to balance it out. So you could have a chorus which on its own measures much, much louder than the Spotify um, target loudness. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the full song is is going to measure louder than the target loudness. So it's all, it's, you can get really bogged down in all of this. And sometimes it is best to just kind of do what do what feels right in terms of the sort of artistic or creative pursuit and not to worry about all of this but but having that knowledge is useful because then you can make kind of educated choices you can think okay do i actually want to consider um all the 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 loudness specifications do i want to consider micro dynamics and macro dynamics or do i just want to do what sounds good and throw it up on spotify and if it's you know if it's if it still sounds good that's great if not 
doesn't matter you know there's there's different approaches but i think having that knowledge of sort of how it all works under the hood kind of sets you up to make those decisions for yourself further down the line um so that's everything well uh, certainly an overview of loudness for music production what i'm going to talk about now is true peak which is something that i've sort of mentioned a few times earlier on but it's it's something that it's it's quite a simple concept but it's not something that a lot of people know a lot about so i've kind of alluded to it but i just want to do a little bit more of a dive into that, what True Peak actually is. So True Peak is sort of defined in opposition to something called Sample Peak. Um, so in digital audio, 0, 0.0 dB is the highest possible sample peak. That is the loudest that your audio can peak. Where, where the volume peaks, it can't go any higher than that. An audio signal that peaks higher than that is going to uh, clip. That's something called clipping. And when audio is clipping, what you'll hear is distortion. Um, and you probably, if, you, if you're already kind of tinkering with audio, you'll probably use a limiter or maybe a compressor to prevent your audio from peaking above a certain level. Um, and many meters and many limiters only measure or limit sample peak and not true peak and that's fine in a lot of situations because digital audio generally exists on your hard drive as a, a representation of a sound in either 16-bit 24-bit or 32-bit but when you play that audio what you're actually hearing coming out of your speakers is an analog reconstruction of the digital audio you're not literally hearing that waveform you're hearing an analog reconstruction of that and depending on the signal chain that analog reconstruction could peak beyond the digital waveform so that's if there's been some codecs used so for example uh, mp3 is a codec if something has been encoded into mp3 that is something that might introduce unexpected peaks into the into the digital waveform um, so those peaks are called intersample peaks they're essentially peaks between the the, the um the bits of digital audio um, and they won't be detected by a sample peak meter or a sample peak limiter and in some extreme cases it, it can peak up to 6 db higher that's pretty unlikely to be honest but it can peak up to up to 6 db higher so true peak is a standard that has been developed to kind of preempt those peaks um, which could be introduced further downstream depending on the signal chain so a true peak limiter can identify into sample peaks and a true peak limiter can preempt them and significantly reduce the risk of something distorting so whether that's distorting uh, when it gets streamed on spotify whether that's distorting when it gets played on a cd or whether it's distorting you know in, in any other situation so for that reason loudness recommendations often specify a maximum true peak level rather than simply a maximum peak level so that's a strict requirement in many post and broadcast scenarios but it's also worth keeping in mind for music production if you want to avoid signal distortion further downstream and in order to differentiate a true peak value is measured using dbtp instead of db so that is literally just db true peak so you might have noticed earlier on there were a couple of measurements i think i gave on one of the earlier slides which i wrote as dbtp rather than just db um and that just means that it's either been measured or um measured or or kind of dictated uh, as a true peak limit rather than rather than just a, just a sample peak um and that does feed into loudness as well so just like to talk a little bit about how loudness and true peak interact i'm realizing looking at this that this is a particularly text heavy <laughs> slide so i do apologize but i'll, I'll uh, kind of try and explain it um in a bit more of a practical way anyway so a common misconception from people who are just kind of starting out um, working with loudness and working with true peak a lot of people assume that they're dependent on each other but that's not the case it is possible for a piece of audio to have a maximum true peak measurement that's well below spec 
but still for it to be very, very loud. If it's a really heavily compressed piece of audio, then that's entirely possible. And the opposite is also possible. It's possible for something to be very quiet, but to have a maximum true peak value um, that's, that's really, really high. And that's because true peak is an absolute ceiling, whereas integrated loudness is an average measurement of the entire song or program, as we've already established. So if your true peak level goes above the target value even once, then the maximum true peak for the entire project is going to be above the target. But you could have several sections which are louder than the target value. Um, and we're talking in terms of integrated or short-term or momentary loudness. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean the overall value is going to be going above spec. So that's that's kind of how those differ. True peak, if it goes above even once, that's it. So say, for example, you're um, working on a project and you've been told, okay, this needs to, this can't peak higher than minus one dB true peak. If it goes up to 0 0.9 dB true peak, even once at any point throughout the project, then that's it. Any kind of QC, that, you know, quality control that's being done on that, it's gonna, it's gonna fail that quality control. Whereas if you're working towards a loudness target of say minus 23 LUFs, there could be a section which measured on its own goes up to minus 20 or even you know minus 18, minus 15, as long as the overall integrated value is still exactly minus 23, then you're absolutely fine. A good way of thinking about this is that a high true peak maximum and a low integrated loudness is generally a pretty good indication that your audio is dynamic. But conversely, a low true peak maximum and a high integrated loudness means that your audio isn't very dynamic. That doesn't necessarily mean anything good or anything bad. Um, it's possible for audio to be um, dynamic and not sound good and it's also possible for something to sound great but not be very dynamic at all. I think people assume that the more dynamic something is that, that that sounds like it should be good if something's dynamic. It's not always the case so you know that's that's not necessarily um, a, a measurement of, of quality but that is just something to, to consider. If you are trying to make something dynamic then you, having quite a high true peak maximum and quite a low integrated loudness is a, is a good indication of that and, vi and vice versa if you're if you're trying to do something i'm not sure why you'd be deliberately trying to do something that's not dynamic but that's yeah I, i'm i'm sort of <laughs> talking myself into a corner there but hopefully you, you get the idea i've just seen something in the chat as well Lorna's asking why is true peak in db and loudness in lufs so that's because dB or decibels is always a, a kind of instantaneous um, value that's that's constantly changing. So at any given moment, whatever your audio is, the the dB kind of peak reading, whether that's in sample peak or true peak, is going to be constantly moving. Well, while while there's audio kind of being fed into your meter or or whatever it is whereas loudness that's always measured over time so lufs is is the way that that's measured um and it's i i i, I can't exactly remember the maths of it but it's basically it's it's yeah l loudness over time so um the fs or certainly the S in LUFS, I believe, stands for seconds. So it's it's a it's a there is a, a formula for um, comparing dB and LUFS, but they are two different things. In the LUFS or LUFS is um, a, an ongoing measurement that's, that measures loudness over a certain duration of time, whether that's momentary loudness over 300 uh, milliseconds, whether it's short term loudness over three seconds, whether it's integrated loudness over the entire thing. And um, whereas dB is just at any given moment, where where is the audio peaking at that point? Does that um, answer your question, Lorna? Cool. Um, so that is actually the end of my PowerPoint. Um, so I will, like I say, do a, a quick demonstration of some of the uh, new gen products which are relevant for this. But before that, does anyone have any other questions? Anything you'd like me to go back over? Anything you'd like me to repeat or clarify? Anything that just didn't make sense?
Uh, Lorna's asking, what is a good range, LUFS range? That's really difficult to say because it partly depends on what you're working on. So, for example, I think that the AES, which is the Audio Engineering Society, I think that they have suggested that minus 18 LUFS is sort of the ideal loudness level for streaming. They've kind of said that that, uh, I can't remember what their reasoning was, to be honest, but it's, that's kind of the, in order to sort of maintain the best quality, the best dynamics, that's what they've suggested is minus 18. To my knowledge, there aren't any streaming services that use minus 18. Most of the music streaming services are slightly louder than that. So like I said, uh, Spotify, YouTube Music and so on use minus 14. Apple Music uses minus 16. Um, Netflix uses minus 27. Although as we established, that's partly because that's a dialogue gated value that it's so low. Um, So there's not really such a thing as a good range. What I would recommend is finding out so it it depends what you're working on finding out what the kind of norms are for what you're doing so if you're working in music if you're doing it specifically for streaming then somewhere between uh minus 14 and minus 16 is good to aim for if you're working on music that's being mastered for cd um then you're probably looking more like minus nine minus ten and again that's not to say that it that's good but that's a lot of cds are mastered around that kind of level um for podcasts i'm not necessarily sure because like i said spotify normalizes music to minus 14 my assumption is that podcasts would also be normalized to minus 14 on spotify but i'd actually i i'm gonna i'm gonna go and look that up myself i I, i'm like 99 percent sure that it must be i can't imagine that they would use a different loudness level for podcasts versus music but also it, it kind of it would make sense if they if they did because again because for example uh tv shows streaming are so much quieter than music streaming it might make sense for podcasts to be somewhere in the middle um what is it that you're actually working on lorna is it music or is it podcasts or what is, what is it that you're doing because that might Again, I I don't think there's such a thing as like a good range for luffs, but it's I might be able to give you a more specific answer if um uh, okay. Um so I probably am maybe misinterpreting what range is, but I'm sure on the loudness meter, although it's been a while since I've used it, that there is a range that's sh- that shows on there, not just not not just the integrated. I thought there was a Yes. Okay, so that what you're talking about there is the LRA measurement um and again that kind of de- th- again what 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 is or isn't a good range sort of depends on what you're working on i believe again using netflix an example off the top of my head i think that they ask for a loudness range between i think it's between eight and so for, for stereo audio I think that they asked for between eight and 12 loudness units for the loudness range and for surround audio. So that's five, one or seven, one or, or more, I think between eight and 18, maybe again, that's something you can look up. If you go to the, um, if you just Google Netflix best practices, audio, um, you'll be able to find their specification that they sent to their audio engineers. And, and that has the, um, that range but yeah off the top of my head i think it's between eight and i think i said eight and 12 for stereo and eight and 18 for the surround but yeah by all means go and fact check that because i that's that's just kind of off the top of my head yeah i suppose um, i was thinking in terms of again i'm, I'm sorry I, I think i think i've seen on the meter min and max and i suppose i was apart from the integrated i was thinking you know what you know what does it matter what the minimum minimum and maximum is um so are you are you mixing for music or are you mixing yeah. podcast music yeah so basically i'm just i was just trying to get um a piece of music to a, a particular level but for some reason my music even though i thought i had made it to one d minus one db it sounded mm-hmm. quieter than everything else on the platform yes and that would make sense because the because 
something can still be peaking at minus one db and not be very loud overall um so what so your solution to that would be to use things like compression and limiting in order to bring the sort of the peaks down and the rest of the audio up um but that's not exactly related to the loudness range it's so what it's 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 sort of hard to articulate. Um, the loudness range refers to I think it's the the highest. It's either the highest momentary or short term value, and the lowest momentary or short momentary or short term value. I can't remember if it's momentary or short term. But what you're talking about is actually having high peaks. So what you would probably need to do is, if you if you look at your waveform, you'll probably notice if it is if it does sound really quiet, but it's peaking at minus one, then. If you zoom in on the waveform, you'll probably notice that there are some pretty big spikes at certain points. And a, a fairly straightforward way of counteracting that would be to use a limiter and to bring it down to around the point where the sort of non-spiky sections are um, are peaking. So say you've got these big spikes that are peaking at minus one, you might have the rest of the track is I don't. I mean, I I don't know without seeing your audio, but the rest of it might be peaking at say minus seven, minus eight. If you bring a limiter down to say minus six, and then sort of uh, compensate for that, so you you limit the audio down and then bring the actual volume back up again. You that would be one way of counteracting that. Um, but obviously, you need to sort of you. Don't just blindly do that and assume it's gonna gonna sound good. You you know you still kind of need to listen to that and and hear how it's affecting the audio and sort of um, you know tweak the limiter, tweak any compression you might be using, and so on. But yeah, it sounds to me as though it's it's probably that the audio is just too dynamic, and so you can use compression and limiting to to counteract that. But the loudness range is is kind of a separate issue. So that's that's probably at least in terms of the specific problem you're talking about mm -hmm. loudness range is probably kind of a red herring yeah okay all right does that, does that make sense yeah, yeah. Thank cool you. anyone else have any questions um so rosie says i'm not totally sure about how best to actually use a loudness meter do i keep an eye on it while i'm listening and editing so a lot of audio engineers will just have like a separate secondary monitor attached to their computer, maybe a smaller monitor off to one side, and they'll just have their loudness meter constantly open. I don't think it's necessarily that useful to keep an eye on it at all times. Some loudness meters, um, including Nugent Audio vis LM, but again, there are other loudness meters that do the same. Some loudness meters will have a history view. So what that means is, as you're playing through the entire project, um, it's drawing kind of a, a line graph of the loudness of the whole thing. I think the Ulean meter does do that, although I've, like I say, I've not used it myself, so I'm not 100% sure. Um, so what that means is that you can, at any point, you can just open the loudness meter and check and 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 kind of scroll through that and see any sections that might be noticeably quieter or noticeably louder or any sections which might be going significantly over or under any target values that you might have set for yourself um it's the 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 approach that a lot of audio post-production guys that i speak to use is they'll have they'll put a loudness meter at the end of their master bus right at the start of a project so first thing they do is they'll open their project they'll put their loudness meter right at the end of the chain and then as they're working and working that'll be measuring at all times and they might not even look at it for the entire thing and then when they're nearing completion at that point presumably say they're working on a project that's half an hour long by the time they've been working on that for like a day every section of audio will probably have been played through the loudness meter at least once. So at that point, when they're nearing completion, they'll open up the loudness meter that's just been running in the background the entire time, and they'll look, okay, what's my integrated value that I've that I've got here? Uh, is that close to what I'm aiming for? So if, if their target value is minus 24, 
if they're an experienced audio engineer, they'll probably know their room really well and they might already be within one or two loudness units of that. So they're working towards minus 24. They've not been looking at the loudness meter the whole time and they look and it's like, okay, I'm on minus 25.5. So I just need to tweak this a little bit more to get it slightly louder to be at my target. Um, so, so that's kind of, I think the best approach is to not worry about it early on to have it there on the project measuring what you're doing, but not to focus on it, not be constantly eyeballing it, because you can just you can really get obsessed in it and it kind of it, it detracts from the um the creative process then. Um what I'd do is just keep it running and then right near the end, then you have a look and it's like, okay, where am I in the right ballpark? Am I way off where I need to be? Do I have any sections which seem to be way louder than the rest do i have any sections it seems to be way quieter than the rest and so on does that um give you a bit more of a of an idea rosie i'm happy to expand on that a bit more cool um great anyone else i was just um, interested in what you were saying right at the very beginning about sort of legislation around commercials being at a similar level to programs in in, in the us Mm -hmm. Presuming that's not there's nothing like that that exists for streaming services like YouTube, because I know this is a big discrepancy. So, <laughs> like that. to my knowledge, everything on YouTube should be normalised at minus fourteen LUFs. But as I was kind of talking about, YouTube are a little bit mysterious in terms of how they actually apply that, and it doesn't seem like they apply it across the board. Um, they definitely should. But they don't. They don't seem to. So it's it, it's certainly there's no there's not legislation about it. The platforms themselves supposedly do govern it. YouTube is a bit of a strange one in that they do just seem to kind of be the YouTube is a bit like the Wild West in some some regards when it comes to loudness. Just because yeah, they don't they don't necessarily seem to um, actually adhere to their own standards all the time. Cool. Thank you. No problem. Um, okay, if there's no other questions, then I might just quickly do a bit of a brief run through. Uh, does it matter if we go much beyond eight o'clock, Heidi? I don't. I've not got much more to get through, but I don't. I don't know kind of uh, how. We finished early. I'm, I'm sure that that's fine. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. I'll uh, bear with me then. So. I've got a Pro Tools session here, but I actually think I need to <laughs> stop sharing and start again in order to make that visible. Bear with me. So I'm not actually going to do um, an audio demonstration here. I'm just going to do a quick visual demonstration of a few loudness tools that, that I might use uh, from NewGen, just to kind of give a, some practical examples of the sort of thing I'm talking about. So this is VizLM, which is our um, loudness meter with a history function. I think this is pretty similar to the Ulean meter, uh, although I'm sure people have used that will be able to confirm or deny. Um, this has all your measurements on the right hand side. So at the moment, I've got this set up to measure my integrated loudness, my short term loudness and my loudness range or LRA. I could set that up to show me some other measurements as well. So I, I've added in now my integrated dialogue measurement and my dialogue gated LRA, so the, the, the range of loudness of the dialogue. If I play my audio through it, you won't be able to hear this, by the way. You just, you'll just be able to kind of see what I'm doing. Um, as I play my audio through it, it gradually builds up a picture of kind of a line graph of where we're at. So if I skip around kind of um, in different points of the project, you can see at the top here is a line graph of my entire session. And this, the larger view is just kind of a, a whatever kind of couple of seconds I'm currently looking at. And so the idea is you don't have to play the entire thing through all at once. You can jump around um, and gradually, like I was kind of talking about, you eventually every section of the audio will have been played through the loudness meter at least once and then once you've kind of um 
been working on your project for a while, this should be completely filled in. You'll have loudness data from the entire project. And then you can look at your measurements here on the right hand side um, and see whether that is kind of close to to what you're aiming for. So I can see here that I've got a dialogue gated loudness of minus 29.8, an overall integrated loudness of minus 28.6, loudness range of 9.1, a dialogue gated loudness range of 6.8, and a short term loudness measurement of minus 29.2. Those are, I mean, those are all just kind of randomly picked out of the air, but that's um, the kind of information you can get from that. This also has a true peak meter as well. So I'm just working in stereo, but it does have a, a meter for surround also. Um, and yeah, this is locked to the time code. So as I'm kind of jumping around the project, all of this is synced with the timeline in my Pro Tools session. Um, so yeah, that's VizLM. That's mainly used for loudness for audio post-production. So for films, for broadcast, for streaming on Netflix, things like that. For music production, people a lot more commonly would use something like this. This is master check. This doesn't have the history view, but it does have a few other kind of useful features for um, music production. Like I was talking about, um, music streaming platforms don't expect you to have your audio already normalized to their loudness target before you submit it. Um, so within master check what you can do is as you're as you're playing your audio through the um integrated loudness value you shows here so at the moment it's about minus 31 for me if i click offset to match that's going to turn it up to whatever target value i've got set here so at the moment this is on the aas streaming practice it's turning it up by just over 10 db by 11.2 lu sorry not db um and then I'll be able to hear, okay, this is how my audio is going to be affected when it's normalized to that. The top here, I could select, let's say Tidal, for example. If I hit offset to match, that's showing me how much my audio is going to be turned up by um, if it gets played out on Tidal. I can also listen to how the audio is actually going to sound in terms of the audio quality. So if I go, say, YouTube low bit rate, I can actually listen to how my audio is going to sound um, if it's being played in bad quality on YouTube. Um, there's all kinds of all kinds of different different ways that I can hear my audio within Master Check, um, and like I say, that is kind of specifically geared towards mastering audio for streaming. We've also got here ISL, which is our limiter, um, which is a true peak limiter, and that allows you to take care of those into sample peaks that I was talking about before. Um, you can set your peak level here. You've got your input gain. So Lorna, for example, you were talking about um, having a peak that's at uh, minus one, but you're, you feel like your loudness overall isn't working. What you could do is use something like ISL, um, set your true peak limit to minus one here, and turn up the input gain, uh, and, and that going to allow you to increase the overall loudness of your audio without the true peak of it increasing so that's one way that you could that you could tackle that um like i said at the start there are on our youtube channel some more detailed videos about all those products so by all means check those out um but that for me now is everything that i wanted to cover does anyone have any other questions before i Skedaddle. Celia, you look like you're about to say something. <laughs> no, no. Okay. No, I'm just taking that all in. That's brilliant. Yeah, I just muck around with music at home. And so this is really useful to, you know, if I want to kind of take it further. Yeah, it's great. Great. Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad about that. If anyone does think of anything after the fact, then feel free to send me an email. My email address is freddy at newgenaudio.com. So that's freddy with a Y. It's nice and easy. I'll put it in the chat here as well, actually, so you can copy and paste it. So yeah, if you do want to ask me anything, there you go. Send me an email. Uh, I think we mentioned the uh, the discount as well at the start, but just to reiterate that, if you go to newgenaudio.com slash gifts, 
you can use the discount code YSWN50 and that'll give you 50% off everything. But of course, there's no obligation for you to buy anything from us. Uh, I'm just happy to tell people that loudness. Um, cool. I think that's that then. And uh, yeah, uh, thanks Holly and Rosie as well for your comments in the chat just there. Great. Thanks ever so much, Freddie. That's been a yeah, really fascinating uh, insight. And yeah, I think I need a bit of time to digest it all uh, as, <laughs> as well. Thanks ever so much. Um, for, for those of you who, who maybe haven't come to a Yorkshire Salmon Network um, event before, we do hope you'll come along to something in the future. And if you haven't already, um, checked out our podcast audio club you might be interested in uh, listening to some of the episodes there so um, um, we will follow up with an email with those um, with that discount code uh, as well and Freddie's email address as well in case you want to get in touch but it just remains to say a big thank you to, to Freddie for um, yeah all, offering all your insights this evening thanks very much thanks for having me cheers yeah, thanks, thanks everyone thank you